Well, you guys chose a good day to be here um, because we brought a good friend of ours back uh, to speak again today. Uh, and he's brought another friend with him. I want to introduce uh, Chris Palmer to you guys. Uh, I told Chris uh, yesterday that I'm going to bring Chris back uh, just for an end times event. How many would like that, to bring Chris back for an end times event? Eschatology, the study of end times. Uh, what I told him was, I said, we're going to do like a multiple day thing so you can like right all of our wrongs and all questions can go to him, okay? So all emails and all, all concerns would go to Chris and uh, he would just set our theology right when it comes to that. But he's a brilliant mind. Great to have him, him here today. Uh, but also, man, I just, wanna, I just wanna say how thankful I am for, uh, for Nate and for Chris and for what they're doing at TheosU. Um, I know he's not gonna talk about it because he doesn't like to talk about it a whole lot, talk about himself, but they're doing an incredible work. Um, and I'm just, I'm so grateful for it and for what it's done in my life. And uh, basically it's like, what, what would you say, Nate? Like theology of Netflix, Netflix of theology, essentially, yeah. Uh, so it's just like a monthly subscription that you pay toward, and uh, man, you just got so much content, and it's helping guys like myself so much uh, to continue my education in scripture, and uh, just grateful for what they're doing. They're changing the game when it comes to uh, biblical studies, so I'm grateful for you guys. I want to thank you and honor you for that. But other than that, man, I'm going to wel welcome Nate to the platform. Let's welcome him up. He's going to come. He's going to speak. He's got a great, great word today. Thank you, Pastor Jay. Well, it's good to be here again in West Virginia. Mason? Okay. There's a Walmart and a Bob Evans, and that's all we need. Um, we, uh, we came up yesterday early. Uh, Chris and I drove up from Nashville. Um, my wife is not here. Last time I was here, my wife was here, but she is uh, very pregnant. Um, about to burst, um, so I'm pretty excited about that. She's due April 22nd, um, and we're having a boy. I'm really excited about that. Not that it, if, I wouldn't be excited if it was a girl. I would be, but I'm, I don't know, I'm half a percent more excited. <laughs> okay? Don't judge me. Um, so this is our first, and I'm really excited. So she's she's unable to do anything at the moment. So she's just eating a lot of ice cream and, and not moving. Um, so I brought Chris here with us. And Chris is the dean of our seminary, um, and he's my travel partner. And we, uh, we came up, so we came up early yesterday. Well, we didn't come up early, but we came up for the afternoon to shoot guns, <laughs> as one does. Um, so last time I brought my wife, she shot guns. It was awesome. I'd never, she was very scared, but we, we trust Jay and, um, and uh, Jake. Uh, and anyway, so we were, sh and, then, and then the boys produced Tannerite. <laughs> and so we shot Tannerite as well. And there were crazy explosions heard around the world. Um, so anyways, it was fun. Eric was there and we were just, it was awesome. There's a, a lot of holes in the side of a mountain somewhere. <laughs> so I feel like I've left my mark and go back to Tennessee. <laughs> anyways, um, it's always great to be here. And I just love this church. I love your worship. I love your pastors. Um, I love to see Jayla playing keyboard this morning, the family getting involved. Isn't that cool? Um, so yeah. <laughs> Give yourselves a hand. Okay, let's read the Bible. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna uh, if you're taking um, if you're taking notes this 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 morning, um, it's a very very great title, um, perhaps memorable. Um, the title of this sermon is "Sharks with Laser Beams." Sharks with laser beams, and um, we're gonna we're gonna get into it in a moment here. <laughs> we're gonna read some scripture, but let me first pray. Father, thank you for your word, and thank you that every the, every time we open the scriptures, there's a shedding of light, and that's what we want, Lord. We need your light in our life, and so we thank you, God, that you're gonna speak to us uh, as a church, corporately, and as individuals with people that are facing all types of different circumstances. 
um, but somehow you can speak both ways. And so, Lord, we're thankful for that. We're thankful for your word, uh, that every time we open it, we hear you, and we've come to meet with you. Uh, we've not come to hear Nathan the Canadian with the funny hat. We came to hear from, from you, God. So thank you that as we open the word, we get to hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's do that. Let's open the scriptures, um, and we're going to begin reading um, in, uh, well, where is it? There it is. It's numbers. Okay. This is a good one. So I'll catch you up to speed on where we're at. Right before this story takes place, the children of Israel uh, have come out of Egypt, and God is bringing them out of Egypt, out of Egyptian slavery, into the promised land, right? So the, the point was never that God just took them out of Egypt, and then just drop them off in the wilderness. It's kind of like, okay, you're on your own, right? When, whenever God takes you out of something, he's bringing you into something, yeah. right? Um, there is a destiny in Christ Jesus for you. There's a place that God has preordained or predestined. Um, Romans chapter 8 says that you were predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. God has an image in his mind of a new you, a transformed you, and that is a, it's, a, it's a spiritual destiny in Christ Jesus. And God's going, I, I took you out of your past, out of darkness, and translated you into the kingdom of light to look like my son. And there's an image, there's a destiny for you, right? So God's bringing you there. Uh, but also, I, th I believe there's a place uh, of optimal human flourishing for you, for your family. God wants you to fulfill the Genesis 1, 26 to 28 mandate. Be fruitful, multiply. God wants good things for you. God knows how you tick. He made you the way that you are, and he wants to bring you into a place of optimal human flourishing, right? Where you are like, you are kicking butt and taking names for Jesus. Yeah. You following me here? Uh, God wants you to, to be blessed so that you can be a blessing, Right? Uh, God, God wants you to, to, to have something to give at all times, right, so that you can flourish, so that grace abounds towards you, uh, so that you can continue that grace, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a place that God wants to bring your family and bring you both spiritually and materially. Jesus came that you'd have life and life to the fullest. It's not just a spiritual promise, it's a material promise as well. David prayed and he wrote, I, you know, I will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Right? We're not talking prosperity gospel here, but we're talking, hey, God loves you and cares about every part of you. You following me here? So God brings them out of Egyptian bondage and he wants to bring them into the land of Canaan, the promised land, the place of optimal human flourishing where they can be the children of Israel so that they can they can worship God, and they can be a blessing to the nations. They're getting ready to go into this promised land. And so Moses is going to appoint 12 spies, and he reads off the list, one spy for each of the tribes of Israel. These are the names, so they kind of rattle off the names just before we arrive on the scene here. In verse 16, these were the names of the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land, and Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. Moses changes one of the guy's names for, uh, for the camping trip. Hoshea means I save. Joshua means Yahweh saves. Pretty important name change, I think, and maybe we'll come back to visit that. Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go up into the Negev and go up into the hill country uh, and see what the land is and whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad, and whether the cities that they dwell in are camps or strongholds, and whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are trees in it or not, be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. He's asking for a lot of details. Uh, it's like my wife asking me about something that happened. What happened? Oh, stuff. Well, tell me more. You know, like, when my wife recounts a story to me, I'm like, can we get to the, just get to the thing. I mean, I, didn't, I don't need to know what color the sky was that morning. 
did the man die or not, you know? Um, Moses is asking for all these details. It's kind of, it reminds me of, um, of, of, because it's quite detailed what he's asking, giving you all these details. You know, bring, bring some fruit of the land. It reminds me of my wife's grocery list as well. Like, if I make the mistake of telling her that I'm on the way home from the gym or something, it's a mistake because she always asks. I know it's gonna, I know it's coming. Can you please stop at Publix and get me some groceries or whatever, you know? And then she'll start rattling off the, la- the laundry list, right, of all the things that she wants. And I always tell her, don't, don't tell me, text me. Right? If you don't text it, it's not coming home. <laughs> I'm not committing this to memory, you know? Um, and so um, Moses is asking, he's, he's a detailed guy. He's asking for some insane details. It's obviously written down. Um, and so let's see what they bring back. Now, the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin to Rahab, near Libo Hamath. Uh, they went up into the Negev and came to Hebron. Hebron was where God spoke to Abraham and said, this is, this is going to be the land of your descendants. And so they're seeing now this place, and if they remember this story, and they know this story, hopefully they would know this story, they'd go, wow, God spoke to Abraham here, and this is, this is meant to be ours. Ahimon, Sheshai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, were there. Those are the names of three giants um, that were famous giants. And Anak, descendants of Anak, are giants, and that's cause for concern. And the original reader would be like, ooh, that's, that's a problem. Um, Hebron was built seven years before Zon in Egypt. Let's keep going. And they came to the valley of Eshkol and cut down from there a branch with a single cluster of grapes and they carried it on a pole between two of them. Those are some big grapes. Now, I don't know uh, the last time, does your Walmart have a grocery department? Okay. I don't know the last time you went to the grocery store at Walmart. You know, the fruit section. Well, let me tell you something. As good as Walmart is, it's not the promised land. <laughs> right? You go over there, and you, it, those are one-handers. Do you know what I mean? You get a cluster of grapes, and you're, it's like that. You know what I mean? Eat them on your side like a prince. Um, this is ridiculous. Can you imagine going to a grocery store and seeing a single cluster of grapes so big that you and your buddy had to carry it out? Like, that's ridiculous. Now, when the Bible's being ridiculous, you're supposed to stop and, and say, that's ridiculous. <laughs> right? The, the point of it being ridiculous is so that you can, you can think about it. What is ridiculous about that? The place that God is bringing them is ridiculously good. It's so, ridic- it's so ridiculously good that they wouldn't believe it unless they saw it. I believe that that is God's heart towards you. God's heart towards you is, I have something ridiculous for your future. And you wouldn't believe it unless you, you, know, you got into a DeLorean. Then don't forget the flux capacitor. Right? And, and you went into your future and you saw the grapes, right? It, it would be ridiculous. God has good things, ridiculously good things, bananas things for you, for your family, for your church, right? In the, na- in the, in the words of, of Frank Sinatra, the best is yet to come. Come on, that's not just a, a, a it's not mere optimism. That is theological, Amen. Right? Jesus always brings out the best wine to, at the end. Yeah. You hearing me? And so God, God has this ridiculous place in Christ Jesus. Well, I don't, you know, I'm not sure, you know. Well, you know, th- this is our God. This is who he is. He's the God of ridiculous grapes. And they brought some pomegranates and figs. Moses probably had some bowel issues and to keep things moving. It was on the grocery list, okay. That place was called the Valley of Eshkol. 
Eshkol means cluster because of the cluster that the people of Israel cut down from there. At the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey. Milk and honey, or flowing with milk and honey, is ancient Near Eastern hyperbole for fully loaded. It's fully loaded. It flows with milk and honey. It's fully loaded. And this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, all the mosquito bites. <laughs> They're in the land. Okay, there are some challenges. Now, I want you to note something here. There are two reports in this story. This is the first report that we just read. And the first report is the facts. There's nothing wrong with the facts. Now, there are some, some Christians, and maybe you've met them before, and they have some extreme views on faith. I'm going to call them extreme. Now, I'm a faith guy. I believe that faith is good. You need to have faith to please God. Um, but you got to make sure that it's faith. And the issue here is that sometimes there are Christians who are so obsessed with some extreme ideas, doctrinally, of faith that they won't even observe the facts. Right? For example, uh, let's say that, that uh, you meet one of these guys. And, and, and so they're, they're coughing and hacking because they're sick. And you're like, dude, are you okay? And they're like, <coughs> they're like, <coughs> I am ruling and reigning with Christ Jesus right now. I'm like, dude, you have COVID right now. You should stay home for a week. You know, it's, it's the flu, basically. Uh, <coughs> no, I'm fine. I'm, I'm, I don't have COVID. It's just a symptom. I'm healed in Jesus' name. You're clearly sick. Go to the doctor. You following me, right? So um, they, they are unwilling to admit that they have an issue or that they have a problem because they believe that they have to guard their confession, right? You can't admit that something is going on in your life. You always have to have this positive confession. And the truth of the matter is that Jesus heals sick people, right? Whenever Jesus would encounter somebody who was sick, um, he would ask them, you know, what do you need? And then they'd tell them, uh, I'd like my legs to work. That would be great. They wouldn't go, I'm healed in Jesus' name. Your name, actually. Interesting how that works. Everything's totally fine, right? Admitting that you have a need is the prerequisite for experiencing the power and the grace of God. You following me here? So there's nothing wrong with going, our pet's heads are falling off, right? There's nothing wrong with admitting that the, that the sky is falling or, or, you know, man, this is happening in my life. I just lost my job and I just got kicked out of my apartment and, you know, some of it was my fault, and, right? Like, you just admit, I've got problems, that's not necessarily a, a sign of weakness. It's actually a sign of strength to admit that you have issues. You following me here? So this first report is it's the facts. There are giants in the land that, that want to keep me out of the promised land. Right? As surely as there's a God who wants to bring you into the promised land, the place of optimal human flourishing, there's a devil who wants to keep you out. Absolutely. There are going to be obstacles. There are going to be challenges. Satan does not want you to thrive. He's committed to you having a bad life. Caleb quieted the people before Moses. They hear the giants. They hear the, the mosquito bites. They're freaking out for good cause. 
There's some obstacles. And Caleb says this, let's go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Now, I'm going to say this about Caleb. He reminds me a little bit of my brother Gabriel. My brother Gabe is 18 months younger than me, and he is wild. He's, 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 he's one of those guys that always gets everybody into trouble, right? He's the kind of guy where it's like, let's, let's you know, let's, oh, there's a cliff. Let's jump off of it into water. And it's like, well, let's stay here. Uh, this is with me. I'm, I'm like, let's go down, swim around to see if there's any rocks at the bottom. <laughs> you know? Um, because I saw this documentary, you know, and, right, that's me. I got anxiety, right? I know, I, I know the, the, the potential of death because I have a mom. We call my mom Debbie Downer. <laughs> my mom knows how you could die in any given situation. <laughs> at all times. When my mom's in church, she's looking up at the light fixtures, wondering if they've been screwed in tightly. She's like, I don't know, that one, that one looks loose. I'm not going to sit there. You know, that's my mom. At Thanksgiving dinner, she's handing you turkey and going, well, you know, choose slowly. You have a 17% chance of choking on that and dying today. <laughs> Thanks, mom. That's my mom. So I got, I got a vivid imagination, high anxiety. I got it from my mom. My brother's a bit more like my dad. Just, he's a wild man. But my brother's a bit broken as well. You know, he's just crazy. Um, when we were kids, you know, he'd, when you're on a swing set, you know, Gabe would go to the, as high as the swing set could possibly go, and then he'd jump off of it. I'd be like, stay on. <laughs> stay on the swing set. Don't jump. Just being with him gives me anxiety. I don't know what he's going to do next. His interactions with wait staff. You know, if you're at Denny's and he's ordering, it's gonna be, it's gonna be, it's gonna be awful. He's gonna say something I'm like, "Don't talk about Trump." <laughs> I know you love him, but just let this one fly. <laughs> That's my brother. You know what I mean? He just loves to just push the envelope constantly, get us in trouble somehow. Um, and um, so, I, I grew up with Gabe, and and Caleb is a little bit like. I think that he's like Gabriel. He's just like, let's, let's just go do it. And I think he, he's vindicated in this situation, but he doesn't really say, you know, God's given to us. He's just like, we can do this. Um, and um, yeah, it just makes me a little bit nervous hanging out with people like that. Um, the thing is, you should have a little bit of anxiety. Uh, anxi anxiety isn't all bad. Anxiety is fear of future pain. That's all it is. It's fear of future pain. So if you've seen too many documentaries and your mind is always, you know, racing, then you could have a, you know, an anxiety disorder where, where you, your mind just always go to the worst possible outcome, right? But having a little bit of anxiety is good. For example, if you're barreling down the highway and the low fuel gauge comes on. You should have a bit of anxiety, right? You should go, oh, I better, I better, right? Because that anxiety is going to save you. That fear of future pain is going to, it's going to give you um, the stimulus to make the right decision. You following me here? So it just means that you have skin in the game and it's warning you so that you can make the wise decision. Right? Gabriel, let's just have fun for a second. Let's say a million years ago, Gabe and I are in a cave. And I'm like, ooh, 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 ooh. And, and I'm like, let's go get some food. I'm hungry. He's like, Gabe's like, ooh, 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 ooh. Right, right? So we go out of the cave and we see a saber toothed tiger. And I'm like, ooh, 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 ooh. Like, let's get away. We forgot our spears. Oh, no. Let's, ooh, 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 ooh. let's go back to the cave. But my brother's like, ooh, 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 ooh. He wants to ride the saber toothed tiger. Because Gabriel's broken. There's no anxiety. <laughs> right? So I run back to the cave. Ooh! And my brother rides the saber tooth tiger. Then he gets eaten. <laughs> That's basically our lives, actually. <laughs> okay. Nothing wrong with a little bit of anxiety. And we're going we're gonna, to... But what's going to happen in this story is it's going to go from a little anxiety to catastrophization 
to, a, to a, an anxiety disorder where the anxiety takes over and you start saying stupid things and making dumb plans. Because that's what happens when fear takes the reins. Fear starts to make all the plans for you and then you start making crazy plans and people are like, what's going on with, what's going on with Joe? Let's keep reading here. We're, out, we're well able to go, There's, you know, we're stronger than they are. Next verse, Numbers 13, 32. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report. Now here comes the bad report, the second report. They said to the people, the land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. Read that one again. The land devours its inhabitants. Land doesn't eat people. The first report was fine. It was, the, it was the facts. The facts are okay. God's not angry at the facts. God knows the facts. But this is not the facts. This is active, crazy unbelief. This is lying. This is catastrophizing. This is making a mountain out of a molehill, as my dad would say. You following me here? This is like saying the, the promised land is full of sharks with laser beams on their foreheads. Yeah. Yeah. There's sharks with laser beams. What? There's it's landlocked. Yeah, I know. There's a shark NATO, man. And the sharks get sucked up from the Mediterranean. Where did the laser beams come from? It's, it's, it's 900 B.C., yeah, I know, but aliens must have strapped the laser beams onto the shark. You following me here? We do this. It sounds ridiculous when I say it, but not when you do it. Come on, we do this. Come on, we do this. We're, we're, we're all guilty of this at times. Some of us, maybe a little bit more. We catastrophize. I wake up in the morning, and I'm full of faith. I don't know what it is about me, but when I wake up, I'm like, I'm going to have a great day. This is going to be awesome. Like, I, just, I have like a reset. It's a gift. Um, by about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, all the fruit of the Spirit has fallen off of my tree. <laughs> it's all gone, right? And it's typically, I'm just a bit hangry. You know, I just need, I need a good meal, right? So I get my good meal, and then it c covers me for a couple hours. But then I start to you know, starts, starts to go down, right? And, and I'm just, ugh, you know, I'm a little bit, so I, you know, try to watch a World War II movie where everybody dies. That usually makes me feel better. <laughs> My wife is like, why do you watch, like, how can you watch Band of Brothers and sleep to that? I'm like, I don't know. It's somehow paradoxically, you know, it's like a baby rattle for me or whatever. It's like, it's like, it's like kids and putting a vacuum on. It's just, it helps knowing that the Nazis are being destroyed. Um, so, uh, but, but, you know, I like to catastrophize at about midnight. I'm laying in bed, and I got Fox News on, on my cell phone, you know, and, and then I'll check out Breitbart, and then I'll check out CNN. Oops, oops, get off of CNN quick. Back to Fox. Yeah, you know, and, it, and, and basically, you're just, you're just seeing essentially that we're all going to die, right, on repeat. Oh, oh Russia. Okay, oh, oh they're going to send, oh, NATO's going to NATO's gonna push this into World War III. That's what they're, they're trying to do. You know, like, oh, the president of Lithuania. Lithuania. Wow, you're an idiot. You know, like, and, and we're all going to die. Babe, we're all going to die, right? So about, by about 1 in the morning, when I should be sleeping, I'm catastrophizing, right? And then you're thinking, okay, well, I need to. I need to. I need to buy a lot of things right now. I need to buy water. I need to. I need to get on that website and order a, a, a generator. Um, I need to get on that other website. I need to order the the dry food that you just add water to it, right? Because it's about to hit the fan, right? I need to buy more bullets. I should have listened to my dad and bought more gold. Come on. Dave Ramsey says if, if, if the end of the world hits, you're not going to need gold. You're going to need a lot of bullets. I think he's right. I'll probably be moving here. 
if you see me like as a local, it, it's, it's about to happen. <laughs> it's good to have friends in West Virginia. <laughs> You know, you start, you start catastrophizing. I remember I was so scared of flying that I, I was like, I'm never going to do ministry. And, well, and if I do do ministry, I'm going to move to Canada, buy a horse, and become a circuit riding preacher. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'm not getting in cars. I'm not getting in, you know, no trains, planes, or automobiles. It's horses only for me. We start to make stupid decisions when you, when fear is allowed to call the shots. And, and I don't believe that we're called to live in a state of catastrophization. Doesn't mean that you don't prepare <laughs> either, but you don't let fear call all the shots either particularly on the things that you know that God has called you to do. Amen. If God's called you to something, you can dig down deep into that. Because he knows the beginning from the end. He's trustworthy. We can trust him. He knows everything. None of us have the crystal ball. But he is the alpha and the Omega. What a friend we have in Jesus. Let's keep reading. So they brought to the people the bad report. The land devours its inhabitants. All the people that we saw in it are of great height. Now everybody's a giant. Right? Everybody was tall. There's an entire basketball team there. Everybody plays basketball there. It's insane. And there we saw the Nephilim. Oh, the Nephilim. Genesis chapter 6. I don't know the last time you read Genesis chapter 6. It's a fun one. It's when the angels marry women, human women, and then they create this other, this other species, half angel, half human. They were called the Nephilim. So now these are like kind of spiritual monsters. Right? We're not just talking about giants here. We're talking about monsters that are going to rip our arms off and bite our heads off who come from the Nephilim. And we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers. See, because in, when you're catastrophizing and your problems are so giant and enormous, you're this big. You are this big in your nightmare. You're this big when you're giving your problems this magnification. And so we seemed to them. We're insignificant to them and we're insignificant in our own eyes. But that's not how God's made you. That's not how God sees you. And that's not how you should see yourself. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry. First George Strait song was written that night. <laughs> the people wept. They're crying. All the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt. I mean, listen, listen to the way they're talking. Or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? No, it wouldn't. You want to know why? There's nothing left. God destroyed Egypt. The Nile turned to blood. All of their cattle and their agriculture completely destroyed. Frogs everywhere. Locusts everywhere. They're probably still upset about all of their firstborn dying. Probably harboring a bit of resentment. Give it a hundred years. Don't go back now. But once again, fear is calling the shots. And so they're making these ridiculous plans. Let's choose a leader and go back to Egypt, they said to one another. Bad idea. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. And typically, they fall on their face when fire is about to come out from the Lord and scorch everybody. So they're just, they're hitting the deck to avoid the fire, right? Joshua and Caleb see these guys hit the deck, and so they tear their clothes like they're at a funeral. And in a last-ditch effort, 
They say to the congregation, the land which we pass through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Do not rebel against the Lord. Let's get to this next verse here, Revelation um, 21. I don't know the last time you read the book of Revelation. Chris just did his dissertation uh, for for his PhD in the book of Revelation. I don't know how somebody could self-harm for that long, for five years. For me, the book of Revelation is, um, it's the type of book that I want to read quickly. You know what I mean? I'm not stopping to look around. I just want to get to the end. Right? Because when you're reading the book of Revelation, everybody's dying. You know what I mean? Like they open a scroll, a third of the earth perishes. You know, and then oh, oh, another third of the earth dies. And, oh, no, you know, everybody's, people are dropping dead of all these diseases. And I'm like, I'm out. I'm, I'm out. Just get me to the end because I know that Jesus comes back and we win. You following me? Yeah. Right? So you get to the, book, the, the end of the book of Revelation, Revelation 21. And Jesus is, is dealing with all of the bad guys, okay? And he's dunking them into the lake of fire uh, that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And so you've got the faithless and the detestable, the murderers, donk, 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 sexually immoral, donk, Harry Potter, double donk, (laughs) idolaters, donk, liars, donk. And you're going, yeah, dunk them, God, dunk them. But the problem is, is that the first one there is cowardly, and that's me. You know, you ever been reading the Bible and you see your name in it? You're like, no, Bible, no. Calm down. That means that you're actually reading the Bible properly when you see yourself in it and not your neighbor. Um, But, you you know, like... What does the Bible mean in Revelation 21 by cowardly? Like people that are afraid of roller coasters are getting dunked into the lake of fire? Hopefully not. Right? Because I'm a goner. Um, in the book of Revelation, uh, one of the themes of the book of Revelation is faithful witness. Jesus introduces himself in the book of Revelation as the faithful witness. He was, he was faithful to the Father. Right? He was a faithful witness to the Father. You see his, his life and his ministry. He said what the Father told him to say. Jesus didn't um, sugarcoat it. He said it straight. Right? He, was, he, he, he was faithful to God. And so the, the, the church in the book of Revelation is called to be a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. And the question that the, the author of the book of Revelation is asking is, are you going to worship God or are you going to worship the beast? Right? You following me? Right? You're going to be a faithful witness to God, a faithful witness to Jesus Christ, or are you going to cave to the pressure that you're sensing and sell your soul, essentially, you know, like Esau, you know, for, for a bit of morsel, for some economic mobility, uh, for, for, you know, so that people on TikTok think that you're cool. So you'll take you know, a stance that is just totally unbiblical to, to, to garner some favor with the guys at the, at the water cooler at work. You following me? That's the type of cowardice that Jesus is dealing with in Revelation 21. Are we going to be faithful to Jesus? Are we going to be faithful to his word? Or do we cave? Now, I don't know about you, but there's a lot of pressure in our world at the moment. Our our young people, specifically, a lot of pressure on them to cave because of the pressure on their friends, the pressure from social media, the pressure from teachers, the pressure from, I mean, it's happening everywhere. Are we going to be faithful witnesses to Jesus Christ or are we going to be cowards and turn our back on Jesus and deny Jesus before men? And I think that there's some faithful witness issues going on here in this text in Numbers. 
There's some cowardice. I love how Moses says that it isn't just, it isn't just being afraid of the giants. They're, they're catastrophizing, knowing that God has called them to the promised land, and then turning on, the, on the, the plans and the purposes of God in their generation is actually rebellion against God. It's rebellion against God. Here's how faith works. Faith comes by hearing. Romans chapter 10. Faith comes by hearing. Faith doesn't start with me. Faith starts with God. Faith doesn't start with anything that I want. Faith has to do with the plans and the purposes of God. You follow me? I, I want a brand new Cadillac Escalade with the spinning rims, right? No roof. Just tear the roof right off. Comes like that, factory. And, and but, you know, I, I, but I can't pray a prayer of faith for the Escalade because God hasn't told me that I can have an Escalade. I'll pray a prayer of hope for the Escalade. And hope does not disappoint. Okay, But I can't pray a prayer of faith for it because God hasn't told me. Faith comes by? Faith comes by? Hearing. hearing the word of Christ. So you can have faith for what Jesus has said to you. You can have faith for what the word of God says. Now, whose idea was the promised land? It was God's. It wasn't their idea. It wasn't their idea to defeat the Egyptian army. It wasn't their idea to go into the wilderness. It wasn't their idea to take the promised land. The promised land was always God's idea. So then they could have faith for it. And I mean, God's literally saying, I'm going to give it to you. That's kind of how faith works. If God's saying, hey, this is my plan and my purpose for you, God's going to bring you into it. You following me? And then your work is to believe God. Someone once asked Jesus, Jesus, what's the works that we can do? Believe me and believe in the person who sent me. So our job as Christians is to believe Scripture. There are some big, obvious things in Scripture that every Christian needs to believe. There's some big, obvious things, right? Like you need to, if you want to know the, the, the specific will of God, you need to at least get the general will of God down. Right? Sometimes we're asking for the specific, oh God, you know, what, what candy bar should I buy in this aisle today? It's like, dude, you're, don't start there. Start with some of the bigger things. Right? Get your ears attuned to the voice of the Spirit on some of these larger issues, and then maybe you can hear God on the candy bar. You following me? Here's, here's a big one. This is like a big, obvious one that every Christian should know. Jesus is building his church. Jesus is building his church. The church is the vehicle for the kingdom of God. You want to bring the kingdom to earth? The church is how we bring the kingdom of God to earth. The kingdom is where the rule of the king is. And the church is where the king rules, right? The, 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 the kingdom is where the words of the king are established. And so as long as the church is holding to the words of the king, this is where the kingdom is. You following me here? Manifesta people are brought home into the, into the family of God and into the kingdom of God through the church. Jesus is building one thing. I will build my church and Jesus, is, Jesus said that he's going to do such a good job of building the church that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the picture is the church raiding hell. That's the picture. It's not that you know, we're all sitting here white-knuckling it, scared of Vladimir Putin, and begging Jesus to rapture us out because we suck at doing our job, and Jesus sucks at doing his. You following me here? Some of us have a, a doctrine of the church that's not from the Bible. And that doctrine is that Jesus is a bad builder and we, are, and the church is just going to become weak and anemic and Jesus is coming back for a weak and anemic bride. And that's not the picture that the Bible paints. 
Jesus is coming back for a pure and spotless and beautiful bride. If you want to know when Jesus is coming back, look at the church. Is she beautiful? She's getting there. She's on the treadmill. (laughs) She's doing keto. Come on, you following me here. Jesus is coming back for a pure and a spotless bride. Jesus is building his church. So if I'm a Christian and I'm living in 2024, there are some promises that I can stand on. There's some things that I can invest my life into. And one of those things is the church. I don't need to be, to be c- catastrophizing or imagining any kind of weird, wacky thing about the church of Jesus Christ. You following me here? Now, I can believe that God is going to build his church because that's what Jesus said. So in, in, in 2024, when things are going crazy, my God, we have an election year. It's going to be a bloodbath. You already know that. You know, brace, brace yourselves. Winter is coming. What do we do? Where do we, where do we sow our life? Where do, I, where do I do with my finances? Where do I sow my, my, my you know, what, what is the safe bet? I'm, I'm nervous. What, what do I do? I'll end with this. If Elon Musk liquidated everything he had and he bought one stock would you consider would you consider maybe investing something into what Elon was investing into what if Nancy Pelosi sold everything she had (laughs) and she bought one stock would you consider following suit? She's up like 1,200% last year. She seems to know things that we don't know. Come on, Jesus knows the future. He is the future. And Jesus is all in on the church. He's all in. And so building with Jesus... And, and sowing your life, your time, your talent, your treasure, being full in on kingdom things, specifically on church things, that is a safe investment and a safe bet. So I want to encourage you today. Be people who know what God is doing in the earth. God, what are you doing in 2024? You, you don't need some weird, spooky internet prophecy to know exactly what you need to be doing in 2024. Jesus already told you. He's like, hey, I'm all in. I've invested everything on the church. Let it guide you. Let scripture guide you. Let your faith come from the word of Christ and be rooted and grounded in the grace of God, in the word of God. Why don't you stand with me? Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for every heart today. And Father, I thank you that in times when we're so tempted to be tossed to and fro, there's so many things going on. There's so many voices and people pulling on us. And we have these real legitimate concerns and fears for the future. God, I thank you that we can trust your word and we can look to those big, obvious things. God, I thank you that your word is not cryptic. God, I thank you that you don't hide things from us, but you have given us the very obvious things to invest our life into. And God, I pray that you would raise up people of faith in North Bend that would know their God, know their purpose, and believe your word and stand firm and grounded in it in Jesus' name. And Father, Father, come hell or high water, we would be found building what Jesus is building, his church his beautiful bride, the people that he paid for with his own life. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Jay. Oh, man, that was so good. I don't know about you.
I don't know about you, but I'm going to allow the future that God has for us to call the shots. Amen. The future that God has for us to call the shots. Thank you so much, Nathan, for that word. Uh, I, I've been encouraged in my faith. I know that the church is the greatest establishment on the planet, and it is what Jesus Christ is building. It just goes right along with the theme. It's almost like we've been talking about the local church recently. I thought it was pretty cool. I don't know if you guys picked up on some of that from, from last week as well. But thank you guys so much for being here. And, uh, and I want to do something as well. I want to I pray for these guys uh, and the work they're doing. Uh, I know that, Nate, you're getting on a plane today in Nashville at like 7 o'clock this evening flying to uh, Austin, right, to teach at a university. So these guys are everywhere, and uh, we just want to pray that, that God would continue to use them. Uh, they have a unique and a special voice, and so we're grateful for them. I'm grateful that they're right here in the metropolis of Mason, West Virginia. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for, for who you are, and I thank you for this word. Um, I pray that it would encourage and strengthen us, God. I know that I'm encouraged, but I pray, God, specifically for, for Nathan and for Chris, uh, God, for their, for their staff and for what they're doing. I just pray, Lord God, for a special grace upon them uh, to continue to, uh, to take your word all over this world. Um, thank you so much for the uniqueness of what is within them. Thank you for using that, God. And uh, I just pray, God, that you would multiply all they're doing in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.